Hello everyone, I'm Norman Walberger and uh, this is a little lecture on music and the sort of foundations of music from a mathematical point of view. I want to go back to the Pythagoreans today who discovered this remarkable connection between the magic of numbers and the magic of music. And that's um, played a big role in the development of, of instrumentation also even into the modern times. So there's some, some beautiful number theory that uh, ends up being involved here, but there's also some curious sort of irrationalities that uh, figure to complicate the situation. So you may think initially that everything is, is really beautiful, and it is in some sense, but uh, it's more complicated than it at first appears. So I'm going to talk uh, today in the context of a guitar. Uh, things are a little bit easier to visualize in some, some ways uh, for a guitar because the, um, the, the various notes are sort of more clearly delineated here with, with these um, frets. And also because there's uh, maybe a little bit more translation and variance here. Um, the piano is, is very much uh, focused in, in, you know, maybe from a C scale because the, the scale of white notes is C. But nevertheless, there's a strong correspondence between the way the guitar is sort of organized and the way the piano is organized. So the various semitones here going up one by one, you know, correspond to going up one fret at a time on the guitar like this. <clears throat> now, the Pythagoreans, uh, first of all, uh, appreciated that they, the pitch or the frequency of uh, a plucked string um, was dependent on a number of things, okay? Um, pr principally, uh, how, how long this thing is, or the extent of the string, but also the material, and in fact the mass of the string plays an important role, and the tension that you're imbuing to the string uh, plays an important role. That's particularly evident with the guitar because I can just change these knobs up here and then uh, tighten or loosen the string, making things go up and down. For example, here, Okay, so um, they discovered um, also that there was um, a remarkable sort of connection between uh, certain notes. We call them intervals, like on the piano. That interval is a, called a perfect fifth, although we'll have occasion to change the name of, of that. Actually, that's not a really good name. Okay, but anyway, it's usually called a perfect fifth. And on the guitar, it corresponds to playing a string, say that one there, and playing this one right here. Da, 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 do, so, do, mi, so, do. The octave, which is more fundamental in some sense, but maybe more sort of elementary, going from a C to a C, or from an E to an E, or whatever, corresponds on the guitar to going from an open position, that is where I'm not pressing anything down, to uh, this fret right up here, the one that's just sort of adjacent to the body of the guitar, that fret there. So that's an octave. And it's the same for every string. That's an octave. Yeah, that's an octave. And so you can see uh, from the architecture of the string that we have decomposed this interval between the bottom note and the, and the top note into how many pieces? Well, let's count. So let's call that zero, okay? And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Why twelve? That's a really, that's a really good question and a very interesting question, okay? It's not shared by all cultures, so this is not some kind of God-given thing. This is something that has arisen in Western culture and, and others too, I suppose. Uh, but, and there's good reason for it that we'll, we'll see. But let's go back to the Pythagoreans and talk about uh, the relationship between the extents of strings and these intervals. So the, the perfect fifth, which I uh, talked about, um, is a little bit more complicated than an octave. But let's start with, actually start with an octave first. The, the crucial thing about an octave is that this position right here, okay, has a very special role with regard to the extent of the full string, which is supported here and here. In fact, this fret here is exactly halfway. And I could demonstrate that by taking a straight edge. Now this thing is actually a ruler, okay, but I want to emphasize that this is not a metrical issue primarily. It's really an issue that um, is best described in terms of affine geometry. 
So those of you who have taken the algebraic calculus course will know that affine geometry is really the sort of the fundamental geometry that drives calculus. Well, here also, and in, in lots of physics, uh, the, the Euclidean structure is a little bit secondary. It's a, it's a red herring often. Okay, and this is a good case in point. So if I take my, my ruler, say, and um, go from this end here to this uh, fret that I've just uh, put, put there, and I make a mark on this straight edge, okay, not assuming any ruling here. I'm just making a mark where my thumb is currently, okay. And then I translate this thing over here up to here, okay, up to here. And then I see I, I, I'm exactly duplicating uh, this thing here. So I can determine that this is the midpoint just by making this sort of affine calculation, okay. So we could say it in another way. We can say that um, the ratio of the links are 2 to 1. Okay, now the Pythagoreans discovered, and it's an incredibly remarkable thing that really ought to be uh, much more widely appreciated in the general public. They discovered that corresponding intervals were associated to some other beautiful ratios of numbers. So first among these is the perfect fifth, the thing that I said we should give a different name to, say from E to B. So with this open string, you know, this bottom open string, which is the E string, uh, I can go from here to here. That's a B. Do, do, mi, so, do, so. Okay, and now the question is, what's the relationship between the initial string and this smaller string that's created when I push down here, basically going from the support here to the support of this fret here? Well, again, this is the kind of thing that we only really need a straight edge to determine because what we can do, okay, is we can take our straight edge and mark here and we're going to, to this fret right here so I can make a, um, you know, a, a kind of a, a mark at that point there, okay? And then I can come back here to the same place. So then I can go uh, sort of one extent here down to here and then one more extent down to here and I see that uh, that two of the, the top ones here will fit into this bottom one. So in other words, the ratio is three to two. That's the, the ratio of extents of strings that correspond to what's called a perfect fifth. And that same ratio, or proportion perhaps is an even better way of thinking about it, applies to any of the other strings. Okay, so I could take the, the top string, for example, and go, that's also a perfect fifth, or, or, etc. So, the perfect fifth is associated to the proportion three to two. That's a good way of thinking about it. It's an affine proportion of extents of strings. Then they discovered a corresponding thing for the other really important uh, interval, which is the perfect fourth. So the perfect fifth and the perfect fourth play some kind of distinguished role in this story. And the perfect fourth, which is from here. If all acquaintance be forgot, da, 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 that's a perfect fourth. Um, that is also determined by a proportion of extents. So the proportion of this thing to this one, the fret that I press down when I want to create a fourth, is four to three. So it's a little bit closer to one to one, right? I started with, started with two to one here, and then I've gone to three to two here, and then now I've gone to four to three. Now those are all really nice proportions, just involving really small integers. And the Pythagoreans were, were amazed that, that the universe was uh, using these fundamental natural numbers in this beautiful, simple way to create these beautiful harmonies or the source of the beautiful harmonies. But in fact, we can go further, okay, because after we've gone from um, 2 to 1 to 3 to 2 to 4 to 3, the next obvious one would be 5 to 4, okay? So which one is 5 to 4? Well, it turns out that 5 to 4 is this one. That's that's what's called a major third. So it's just the, the fret just before the perfect fourth. Okay, so, or in other words, it's zero, one, two, three, four. It's really the fourth one up, counting from the, the bottom, starting with zero. Okay. So that, that 
ratio of strings is 5 to 4. And, um, and what about this one? The next one, that's a minor third. Well, that turns out to be 6 over 5. Uh, so this is a, you know, a beautiful thing that these simple proportions correspond to these lovely uh, intervals that are sort of foundational for, for at least modern, a lot of modern music. Now, um, you could say, okay, what about other intervals? Like, what if we go from a fifth to a sixth? What's a sixth? So on the piano, that's uh, like going, for, say, from C to A, okay? And we can uh, apply what we've learned already to sort of figure that out. Uh, so you can think of uh, this six as being the combination of a perfect fourth from C to F, and then a major third from F to A. So the C to F, we said that was uh, a perfect fourth. That was four to three, okay? And what did we say was a, um, a major third? We said that was five to four. So if this ratio is four to three, and this ratio is five to four, and then we put them together, what are we gonna get? Well, it's a multiplicative aspect here. It's, we're all just, always just taking proportions, so it's multiplicative. So we have to multiply four thirds by five quarters, and we get five thirds. That's the six right there. So what I'm saying is that if you look at this length here and then compare it to this length here, then that can be established to be in the ratio of five to three. And you could establish that with just a straight edge by essentially doing sort of Euclidean uh, algorithm uh, and taking this thing here and, and, and putting it there and, and sort of subdividing correspondingly. And ultimately you'll see that, uh, you know, you can divide the whole thing into, into five pieces so that this first, the first three go up to here. So the ratio of five to three. Okay, so um, this is uh, really beautiful and, you know, led to almost mystical, uh, mystical approach to, to the world by the Pythagoreans. The, this was solid evidence that mathematics and the universe were in some kind of tight harmony. However, when we look at the situation uh, a little bit more deeply, we see that this is um, not so, so clear. Um, because it turns out that while we can cook things up so that some of these ratios are, are perfect. In other words, I, I can put the frets uh, exactly where uh, you know, I, I, they need to be in order for those, those proportions uh, to work. But then it turns out that if we go, say, to the next string and do the same thing for, for it, that the, um, there's not a, uh, a good coherence necessarily between one string or another. Or to put it another way on the piano, you can sort of arrange so that one particular key you know, has, has perfect fifth. That could be a perfect fifth, that could be a perfect fourth, and that could be a you know, major third, and that could be a major sixth. But then if you try to transpose things and then start working in some transposed key, you find that the decisions that you've made for the key of C end up distorting what goes on in the key of D or any of the other keys, okay? And, um, and so, Anyway, so there's, there's some kind of problem that's um, somehow connected with our desire to subdivide the octave into uh, 12 pieces. So in my next video, I want to talk about that. I want to explain, you know, why is it that we subdivide things into 12 pieces and uh, what are the, the implications of that, um, the number theoretic implications of that for music. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.